Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sasano, and today's the 4th of April 2022. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So a couple of things just before we get into the news from the weekend. I will be on a uh, Twitter Spaces with Dow Under on Wednesday, April 6th at 6pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I think that is quite late uh, US time and uh, early morning uh, European time there. Uh, I think it will be recorded, so if you do end up missing out on it, you'll be able to kind of like... Um, uh, rewatch it or re-listen to it, I should say. We'll be just talking about all things Ethereum, something you know, pretty laid back, nothing, uh, nothing probably too spectacular or out of the ordinary for people who watch the refill every day. I feel like if you watch these other interviews I do with other people, <laughs> you, you, you probably hear the same things that I talk about on the refuel. But I guess like the the point is always to reach a, a newer audience and to guide them towards the daily way, to guide them towards learning more about Ethereum and things like that. So if you're keen on listening to that anyway, it'll ha be happening here, and I'll link it in the YouTube description. And I recorded two videos today with the popular YouTube channel, Altcoin Daily. Now we talked uh, about the merge in the first video and then layer twos in the second video. I thought it was a really great conversation and I think that I'm gonna be able to reach a much broader audience by talking to the Altcoin Daily audience because they probably typically aren't daily gray uh, listeners or viewers which is really awesome like i always want to reach newer people because of the fact that uh we need to kind of like educate the broader crypto space uh, about ethereum especially around kind of like bad narratives around the merge and, and how ethereum scaling and stuff like that so i was i was really honored to be invited on to do those videos with altcoin daily which should be out sometime this week or next week i believe uh but keep an eye out for that i'll share them in the discord channel once once they've come out uh but yeah, it was very very fun to do that there all right, so something that I guess is not directly crypto related, but just kind of like got announced was that Elon Musk has taken a 9.2% stake in Twitter. So he's bought 9.2% uh, of uh, Twitter share, uh, uh, sorry, uh, passive Twitter shares here, which makes him, I think, the largest Twitter shareholder. Now, Twitter stock price is up 25% in pre market trading, and uh, Doge is also up because people are speculating that, you know, Elon Musk, Elon Musk is going to integrate Doge into Twitter in some way, which isn't a bad thing to speculate on. He's been pretty consistent with his doge kind of like outlook but at the same time who knows right so what what does this mean what has it got to do with crypto besides the doge thing i think that you know since jack dorsey left crypto twitter has done a bunch of things that they probably wouldn't have done without jack dorsey there such as the nft integration right the um the ethereum integrations in general uh and just going more towards the web3 stuff because jack dorsey has not been i guess quiet about how much he thinks web3 is just you know, pointless and the same as the existing um, uh, infrastructure and, and not like a step above what we what we currently have. Uh, and, you know, I, I've said before that I think Jack Dorsey is basically a Bitcoin maximalist. That's, that's probably why he thinks like that. But I don't think Elon Musk is. I think Elon is still very open to learning more about crypto in general. He said some uninformed things in the past around particularly scaling and how Dogecoin could scale and things like that. But you know, he's with, I mean, you know, he's kind of like spending a lot of time with Dogecoin. Vitalik is uh, is an advisor, I think, to the Dogecoin Foundation or something like that. So if Vitalik and Elon, you know, are having conversations and things like that, then what could end up happening is that uh, Elon could kind of like use his newfound influence in Twitter to kind of push more Ethereum related integrations here. Uh, you know, that's kind of like my, my dream kind of like list uh, or at least kind of like features that I would like to see. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I think... You know, Elon's been active on Twitter recently saying kind of like how he believes that the algorithm is, you know, the algorithm's kind of like um, not great. The way Twitter kind of like handles news and, and fake news and propaganda and all that sort of stuff is really, really bad. And he's been quite vocal about that. Now, he took this stake in Twitter on March 14th and he was posting about these things, I think, two weeks after that. So he's obviously got some sort of plan here, but it remains to be seen exactly what it is. So as I said, not like totally crypto related, but Elon has been very active within, you know, the crypto space. Just because he's promoting Doge, talking about Doge, doesn't mean he's not active within it. That's just like, like what he's interested in. He, you know, Tesla obviously kind of like had their Bitcoin buy last year. And I think it was last year or the year before. It might have been the year before. God, time flies. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's, there's kind of like movements here. So th there is relations here to, to talk about. I'm curious to see if Elon Musk does anything with his newfound stake in, in Twitter here and, and seeing kind of like what influence he has on a, on a broader spectrum here. But I just wanted to kind of like mention that because I did think it was, uh, you know, not totally crypto related, but something relevant to, to all of us in, in crypto. 
All right, so something that Terence uh, from Pry Labs tweeted out the other day that I actually didn't know about. So he tweeted this out saying, fun beacon chain fact. Once 327,680 active validators are reached, activation exit queues rate limit increases from four to five. Every epic five instead of uh, uh, five instead of four validators can now be initiated activation. That happened today. Okay, what does this mean in plain English? Well, uh, I, wait, I, I'll back up for a second. Actually, I didn't know this, right? I you guys know I pay a lot of attention to the Ethereum protocol layer, a lot of attention to the beacon chain, things like that. But I didn't actually know this was a thing. And this was in the code. Like you could actually go read the code or read an annotated version of the spec and you could see that this this existed there. But it obviously wasn't something that was talked about much because of the fact that we needed to reach like a very high active, uh, you know, validate account um, to, to kind of like get here. And it's not exactly something that is, I guess, like bullish for the price or anything like that, for example, right? So it tends to get less coverage. But in saying that, what is really cool about this is that I've talked about this kind of like entry exit queue before with the beacon chain while, and you know, the deposit queue essentially or the validator entry queue. Now, right now that is quite high because there's a lot of ETH coming in. There's a lot of um, validators that need to be activated each day. And I think before it, sh it changed from four to five per epic, it was about 900 validators that could be activated per day. Now it's 1200. So we've obviously sped this, sped this up. So the queue will actually clear faster than it would have before. Uh, and, and that's because we reached a certain amount of active validators uh, as, as coded into, into kind of like the beacon chain. So, I mean, what I find really cool about this is two things. One, the fact that I, I'm still learning stuff about beacon chain, about Ethereum core development, uh, even though I've kind of like engrossed myself in all of it, I'm still learning stuff like this, which is just amazing to me. You know, what else don't I know? Like I'm going to have to go back and, and read through it and see what else I don't know. I'm sure there's other things I don't know here. Um, and, and two, I like the fact that we that this is actually a thing, right? This is actually a feature where we can actually speed up the amount of validators that can come in once we reach a certain number of active validators. And I mean, guys, lately, you know, staking has been blowing up on Ethereum. Like, I, I don't know if it's the... Uh, I mean, I, I suspect it's the FOMO of the merge is coming. People are like, oh, what's the merge? Oh, wow. You know, it's going to be when Ethereum actually goes through proof of stake. It's going to be really bullish for the price. And, you know, I can stake my ETH and get a 4 or 5% kind of yield right now uh, as kind of like a risk-free rate. And then post-merge with the unburnt fear of when you're going to stakers instead of miners, those yields could jump up to 8 to 10%. Now, to us crypto DGENs, 8 to 10% yield may not sound like a lot, right? But let me, let me put this in context for you. So this is 8 to 10% on your ETH. This isn't on stable coins or anything like that. This is on ETH, when ETH is obviously uh, an asset that will appreciate over the long, long term. Well, maybe not obviously to some, but to me it is, right? So not only are you getting 8 to 10% yield, you're getting it on ETH. And if ETH goes up, you know, say 2x from there, it's a lot more than 8 to 10% effective yield. Secondly, it's a risk-free right, or, or near risk-free where the protocol is actually paying you this ETH, right? This is not coming from people taking out leverage. This, isn't, this is not coming from you know, speculative uh, kind of activities. This is coming directly from the protocol. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's constant. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of like known. Uh, it's easy to reason about. And as I said, it's very low risk, especially if you're staking on your own uh, because the biggest risks are slashing. So you actually have to be, you know, actively attacking the network or you, maybe you've had a redundant setup that you, that you set up and it's accidentally signed uh, kind of like two things at once. Um, or, you know, you go offline for too long. But as I mentioned before, going offline isn't actually that big of a deal. Uh, and, and yeah, even staking with kind of like, I mean, there are the centralization risks as well if you stake with a centralized exchange, but still, like it's a very, very low risk yield compared to other yields in, in crypto, especially within DeFi. And it's a yield that isn't reliant on leverage or anything like that. Like, for, like what I mean by this is that leverage-based yields fluctuate greatly depending on what the market's doing, right? But whereas with with a, with the um, ETH staking yield, it's going to pay four or five percent. I mean, depending on how much ETH is staked, is, is is the yield. So let's say it's just paying four percent, right? It's going to pay that four percent if the, if the amount of ETH stays uh, staked stays the same. It's going to pay that four percent no matter if ETH is five thousand dollars or two thousand dollars, right? It doesn't matter. Like the yield does not change based on that. The yield changes based on how much ETH is staked. So from that perspective. People absolutely love this, right? This is like an internet bond, essentially, as Bankless has been calling it for quite a while, and a bunch of other people have talked about this as well. And then throwing everything else, kind of like the merge coming and all the other upgrades coming and and just like the issue introduction with the merge. Like, I, I feel like there's just like a very, very big FOMO to get into staking right now. And that's why we have this, this kind of like validated queue. That's, I mean, the amount of, uh, I, the, I think the validated queue is almost 14,000 validators right now, which is crazy, right? That's 14,000 times 32 ETH. 
which is a crazy amount of kind of like ETH that's come in. And it seems to have stuck around there. Like we're clearing out validators each day, but there's just more and more people staking. And we're at, uh, I think, once once the validator, sorry, once the um the queue is cleared and once those validators get activated, we'd be at near 11 million ETH staked, guys. That's absolutely crazy. Like, I mean, that's a lot of ETH, right? I mean, ETH's market cap is really large. So even just like, you know, eight or nine percent of the the kind of like uh, supply there is a huge amount, tens of billions of dollars. So very very cool to see to see all that playing out. But yeah, cool of cool of Terence to bring up this um this uh, kind of like fun fact here. I didn't know about this at all. I'm glad that I do now know about this. And I wonder if it, it jumps up from like to six, from five, if we reach a certain number of active validators uh, uh, from there. So we'll have to see. Uh, uh, oh, it, 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 do it does happen. There's a comment here. When update to six at 380,000 validators. That's not too far away, right guys? Like this is cool. I, I don't know. I'm gushing over this because I just think this is a really cool thing that I didn't know about. Uh, now that I do know about it, I, uh, I'm just running through the implications in my head there. But yeah, I mean, uh, there's a couple other things around staking that I wanted to talk about and a, a massive milestone really reached by Rocket Pool over the weekend. They onboarded their 1,000th node. Uh, and you know, you can see Superfears here talking about this. I'm sure there are over a thousand nodes now. I haven't checked, but this this happened uh, two days ago. So this is really cool. You know, that's uh, that's over a thousand nodes worth of ETH kind of um, staking with Rocket Pool. Uh, and, uh, you know, the funny thing is like, Rocket Pool is doing really well, I think, uh, compared to where they are in their life cycle. They... They're limited in what they can do compared to something like like a Lido because of the fact that they need to spin up like these new nodes. They're limited by, how, by the RA that can be minted and things like that, uh, especially with the uh, the validator queue being the way it is. But their growth has been really really nice to see. I would I would have liked you know them them to have like grown more uh, than what they are now. But I mean, look, I don't think it's a big deal. I think Rocket Pool. Eh. I think Rocket Pool is as easy to stake. Like I'm, I'm just trying to run this through in my head, so I, I say this right and I get this right. I think Rocket Pool is as easy to stake it as, as it is with with kind of like Lido, in that you can buy kind of like R ETH just like you can buy ST ETH. But when you want to actually put your ETH in or deposit your ETH into it, it becomes harder. Like change your ETH into R ETH through the protocol itself, it becomes more difficult because there's, there's kind of like more stuff that needs to happen in the background for more RA to be minted and it can run out very quickly compared to something like STE. And you can see here, Spencer Noon put out a, a kind of like tweet thread looking at some data of like, where's the, most of this ETH kind of like coming from into into the beacon chain and most of it is coming from from lido you can see here in the orange is lido on this chart which i think is like uh 70 of the of the eth that staked came uh, in march and you can see you know in other months they've been quite big but in, in march has been really really big so 70 percent of the stake that went into the beacon chain was from from lido which Look, it's not the end of the world. At least Lido distributes the stake amongst centralized staking providers and doesn't just concentrate it in one. Uh, but it is not exactly ideal. We would like we would love to see a more kind of like even distribution of stake, but this is kind of like the reality of what it is today. But in Spencer's uh, tweet thread here, what he basically says is that he thinks this is new money coming in. This isn't existing money. This isn't people with you know ETH that they've already got staking. Uh, he thinks this is new money, especially maybe institutional big money coming in uh, and staking their ETH. And it makes a lot of sense because if you, I mean, it's been what, 15 months since the beacon chain went live. If you already had ETH and you haven't staked it by now, and, uh, uh, and, and you know, staked it when the yields were actually higher because there was less ETH staked, then if you're staking now, you're a low percent of the people that would be, the, the, the ETH that, was, that would be going into the beacon chain, I believe. So, if it is, which the evidence points to, new ETH being staked, new ETH that's being purchased off the active, uh, off the public markets and being staked, that's even more bullish because it means that we're removing supply from the active market of ETH, putting it into staking, and and people kind of like, and we're getting more validators spun up, which is obviously good for network security and good for for sharding when it's implemented and things like that. That to me is the most bullish thing. Like it's all well and good for people who already have ETH to stake it and that's fine. But if we have net new buyers coming in, buying ETH, and they're not only holding their ETH, deciding to stake their ETH, that's amazing. I really, really like that. Even if it's through, you know, one, uh, uh, the majority is through one provider. I don't think that's actually a, a, a huge deal, as I say, because it's Lido. If 70% was going to Coinbase, then I'd be a little bit more concerned. Uh, but because it's Lido, I'm not as concerned. But obviously, you know, we'd prefer a, a more equal distribution. Maybe we had like 20% going to Lido, 20% going to Rocket Pool, you know, 60% going to the other providers sort of thing, uh, you know, uh, equally matched between them. Ideally, you know, you have some percentage being self-stated and stuff like that but I, I do get these days if you're a, a new money buyer 
there's not that many new money buyers that are going to be able to purchase the 32 ETH to stake on their own. Uh, that's It's a lot of money, guys. Like, I mean, it just keeps going up too as the ETH price goes up. So I think the only people who are going to be doing that are like big funds and institutions. But even then, I don't think they're going to stake on their own. They're going to go through some sort of provider, if not setting up their own infrastructure. But I feel like most of the time, they're going to go through one of the existing providers just because it's already there for them to use. They'll pay a small fee on it. And maybe they repackage those products for their own customers if they're an institution, as I, as I described last week, uh, where these traditional funds finance institutions can repackage those kind of like yields and sell it to their customers and, and all that sort of stuff there. So I imagine there's a bunch of that stuff going on, but very cool to see that this is most likely new money coming into the ETH staking ecosystem. Uh, and yeah, I, I mentioned, you know, almost 14,000 pending validators on Twitter the other day, the FOMO to stake ETH is real. It is. I mean, it, it's just amazing to me how like in a few months, the narrative around ETH staking, the merge, the ETH introduction, triple halvening has totally come into like the limelight. And we now have mainstream media coverage of this stuff on things like CNBC and, and stuff like that. So it's just... I mean, if you've been watching the refuel since pretty much day one, I'm pretty sure within the first kind of like few episodes, I would have mentioned this sort of stuff. And day one of the refuel was, uh, I think, late 2020, I believe it was. Um, so if you've been watching since then, you knew about that since then. If you've been following me before that, you've known about it. And the fact that it took this long for people to clue into it is just hilarious to me. And I think a lot of people, even ETH bulls, underestimated just how... Uh, uninformed most of the people were even within crypto around this and now everyone's suddenly kind of like cluing into it everyone's like oh you know holding ETH into the merge and you know after the merge is like the most kind of like the best thing you can do the safest way to kind of like earn money whatever like I don't I'm not going to make any comments on what's safe and what's not safe but look guys if you've been around for a while you're ahead of the curve that's for sure uh which is which is which is obviously really cool it's as i said one of my highlights of doing the refuel is going back and looking at how early i called stuff and how early i kind of like told you guys about stuff before it becomes kind of like you know mainstream knowledge uh and i always love i always kind of like love doing that so so yeah there's that there and finally uh on the staking front uh, Summer Esat has updated his Ethereum staking guide. So he's added info for fallback to ETH1 nodes for Prism, Teku, and Nimbus, added steps for pruning Geth, uh, and added steps to clean up system uh, system D logs here. So uh, I've highlighted these um, guides before on the refuel. They're some of the best guides out there for setting up staking, you know, solo staking on your own. So definitely check out these from Summer Esat here. I'll link it in the YouTube description for you. All right, so the Ultrasound Money website has a new dashboard live where they're showing the total of value secured by the Ethereum network. So if you scroll down here to the bottom, I believe, you can see total value secured uh, on Ethereum. Now, this is counting kind of like the ERC-20s on Ethereum. Uh, this is counting uh, the ETH on Ethereum, obviously, as well, uh, and NFTs and stuff like that. So you can see here that, obviously, the Ethereum network is securing, securing $416 billion worth of ETH. $320 billion worth of ERC-20s and $20 billion worth of NFTs. Now, the NFTs are a bit harder to kind of like measure, I think. It just depends. You have to kind of like measure the most active ones and then it becomes a bit difficult because there's no active market for them. It's more of kind of like going off the, maybe the floor prices and stuff like that. But still, it's, you know, it, it, it's 20 billion here out of the 760 billion, uh, which is, I mean, it's not nothing, but like obviously ERC-20s are a lot bigger. And you can see on the right in the ERC-20 leaderboard, uh, stable coins are, you know, the first, the top three, USDC, USDT and BUSD, the top three there. And then four, is actually uh, Shiba Inu, which uh, is, is quite funny to see there, one of the dog tokens. And then you have Wrapped Bitcoin and a bunch of other tokens like Crow, Matic, STETH, um, which is like obviously Lido Stake ETH, and you can keep scrolling down the list here. So very cool to see this new dashboard. The Ultrasound Money website is one of my favorite websites. I absolutely love all the information they have on here. I mean, they just started out with... Um, with kind of like this burn tracker uh, and you know you can simulate the merge and see kind of what the ETH supply is going to be post merge now you've got the total value secured uh, thing here you've got the monetary premium so you got kind of like uh, uh, ETH's kind of uh, profits uh, compared against other companies and stuff like that and apply in, you know implied ETH price based on this and you can you got like sliders here that you can play around with um, you know projecting the supply chart here based on a bunch of different factors and a list of everyone that has uh, the BAT signal which is the ultrasound money signal in their 
Twitter uh, uh, kind of like our name here. Now, one of my most proud achievements is that I'm number one on this list because it goes by uh, follow account, the, the the first bit, and then um, uh, sorry, it goes it goes it goes by the amount of people that are following you from the fam. So I have you know m- pretty much all of the ultrasound money people following me as well, which is which is pretty cool here. So I, I really like that. But yeah, that's a little thing there, and there's a bit of a Q and A down the bottom as well. So if you haven't checked out this website, be sure to do so. It's a it's a very good one. All right, so Immutable has done something that I think more teams need to be doing, and they've shared the kind of, I guess, uh, or I guess like they've shared something called an IMX tokenomics portal, which is they're calling a one-stop shop for the token vision and strategy of Immutable X in scaling Ethereum NFTs on L2. Now you can go to this link here, which is basically a Notion uh, kind of document, and you can see on here uh, basically everything got to do with the IMX token. Now you can go to like protocol metrics, grants dashboard, supply schedule, which is obviously something that a lot of people are. Uh, are kind of like curious about uh, and as you guys know i'm an angel investor in immutable x here so this obviously kind of like affects me but you can see here you know who got in on uh sorry who, the private sale what their unlock cliff is which basically means like their tokens are locked for a year and then they unlock and then the unlock length of two and a half years and unlock frequency of 28 days you can see public sale public sale and project development and foundation reserve and the current unlock status the supply forecast this is really really cool i mean this is basically giving you all the information you need to know about the the imx token itself and then you've got like protocol metrics here a bunch of different ways to kind of like uh, uh, look at protocol metrics such as transactions, uh, sales, uh, you know, tweets and stuff like that, uh, uh, and and t- and team information. And there's just like a bunch of stuff on here, so you can go check this out for yourself. There's the roadmap and stuff too, uh, and 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 check it all out. I really really like uh, that that they've put this together. That Immutable has put this together, especially the the kind of like token. Um, uh, sorry, where is it? The the supply schedule, because I think a lot of people get scared sometimes where they see, wow, all these tokens aren't so circulating yet where are they you know when are they coming to market and they want to make a more informed decision with them when they're buying tokens and i you know i totally get that i do that too and it's not usually easy to figure out this information. It's usually buried in some documents, if not, pub- and you, sometimes it's not even public at all. So the fact that this is just front and center now with all the available information here is something that I really wanted to highlight and you can go check out. I'll link it in the YouTube description uh, for you below. All right, so Starkware has announced something called the Stark Gates Alpha, which is a uh, Starknet bridge, and now it is live on Testnet. Now, this is not to be confused with that project Star uh, Stargate or Layer Zero. Um, that that's kind of like using that terminology. This is actually Starknet's bridge from Ethereum, uh, kind of like Layer One, into Starknet Layer Two. And as I said, this is live on on Testnet now. So uh, this is, as I say, the gateway between Ethereum and Starknet, and allows users to do everything they can expect uh, from a bridge. So if you want to see how it works, you can visit the technical documentation. You can read this blog post for a bit more information on it as well. This is cool. I mean, the Starknet ecosystem, as I've said to you guys before, is coming together really, really nicely. And the reason why I'm really excited about the Starknet ecosystem in particular is because it is not your traditional EVM compatible network. We've already got plenty of those and those are awesome and I love them. But I, as I've said before, I do like to see more experimentation happening uh, outside of the EVM. So very cool to see that this has entered uh, kind of like alpha on testnet. And you can go you know, check out this uh, blog post. I'll link it in the YouTube description for more information on that. All right, so David Michal has updated his l2fees.info website to now show what percentage of Ethereum L1 fees are paid by L2s. So you can kind of like go into total L1 security costs here and kind of like see, uh, you know, one day security costs. I've showed this before and then you can see percent of total. So the current percent of total is actually quite small still. It's 0.7%. So out of all the L2s, they're using 0.7% of Ethereum's block space. Uh, and I think they peaked at... I would say 1%-ish or maybe just over 1%. Um, uh, and then you can kind of like see, oh yeah, here we go, percent of L, L2 fees. So I think the peak, the highest they've been is 1.4% and uh, they're at 0.7% right now. As I said to you guys, this is going to be a bit of a, a bit of a long journey to get L2 fees, uh, or sorry, to get you know the, the, the amount of block space that L2s are using up to those kind of like higher marks, like 10, 20, 30%. I think it'll happen maybe quicker than we realize uh, once it once it gets going. But for now, layer one Ethereum fees are mostly high due to MEV arbitrage transactions, which is also MEV. Uh, a lot of people still live on layer one Ethereum. There's uh, a lot of kind of like bot activity as well. There's a lot of NFT activity. Uh, there's a lot of you know drops, trading, minting, all that sort of stuff. So. 
I think until all that activity moves off layer one or at least gets priced out, because I do believe eventually layer twos will price out the MEV activity. And MEV is really only profitable a lot of the time when there's kind of like liquidity there to, to MEV and users and, and, and trading going on. But if all that moves to layer twos, then it's going to become very hard for you know MEV to be extracted. And then the kind of like uh, uh, L2s will keep kind of like eating into that market share. So right now, you know, on average, I would say they're around kind of like 1%-ish of, of block space, uh, but they're going to go up over time, I believe, as kind of like we get more adoption of these L2s and as we as we kind of continue the journey there. But cool to see this. Check out this website. I'll link it in the YouTube description. So Zappa has announced that if you hold a Zappa NFT of any kind, you can now participate in the beta test of their iOS mobile app. So you can basically join the Discord, verify NFT ownership, uh, react with this certain emoji, and download the app and feedback form in the iOS app tester channel. So obviously I'll link this in the YouTube description for you to check out as well. I got an invite to this uh, a bit earlier. I believe it was last week before they kind of like announced this uh, and I played around with the app. The app is very smooth. I really like it. I really love how it how it plays out. Uh, and the reason I got the invite before is because you guys know I'm an investor in Zappa. So obviously they wanted to get their um, their investors kind of like testing it out and on board with it. Uh, but now it's pretty much open to anyone that holds an NFT, a Zappa NFT, which is very, very cool. So this is, this is cool because... You guys know that I'm not really a big mobile wallet user. I do pretty much all of my transactions on my desktop using my hardware wallets. Uh, but in terms of what I use my mobile for, I want to. I'd love to be able to track my entire Zappa on my on my mobile, right? Because I, right now I do, I do it on my desktop, but I, I don't really do it on my mobile. Yes, you can do it if you go to the Zappa website and import everything. But I'd love like a native mobile kind of like a, a dashboard tracker there that just works nicely on on iOS because I, I use an iPhone. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I really like that the fact that they're, they're kind of like building this app and I think it's going to bring a lot of value to people. And they're also building a wallet, by the way. This isn't just an app that's like Zappa itself. They're actually building a full-blown wallet, which is which is definitely going to going to come in handy for a lot of people as well. So definitely go check this out. If Even if you don't own one of the Zappa NFTs, they're pretty cheap to get get, a, get your hand on one, uh, you know, whether you buy it on secondary or otherwise. So yeah, if you want to check it out, it's not it wouldn't be too expensive to pick up one of these NFTs either either here. All right, so we have a very interesting exploit out of the inverse, inverse finance ecosystem that happened over the weekend. You can see here Igor from the block broke it down. So basically $15.6 million was stolen, which is very small compared to the Ronin hack we saw, but still that's $15.6 million worth of user funds that has been stolen. The most interesting thing about this kind of exploit is that the attacker actually put at, uh, put up at risk 901 ETH. So in order to do this exploit, they had they had to risk 901 of their own ETH to get to basically manipulate. I believe it was an Oracle manipulation that happened here in order to kind of like steal steal these funds from the protocol. And you can read Igor's full thread here to check it out. But I mean, I think that's pretty crazy, right? I mean, 901 ETH. That's uh, well, head math, maybe three million dollars or something like that. Uh, if I'm doing my head math correctly, to steal 15.6 million. I mean, obviously it was worth it, but at the same time, that's a big risk to take. It's like you're risking $3 million that could have gone against you if you didn't do the exploit right and it didn't work out uh, to, to make another 15.6, which is which is fine. I mean, obviously the payout was, that was a big deal, but yeah, I just thought it was like a big risk that the attacker kind of took here, but... I guess, unfortunate for the inverse kind of like finance team and the inverse finance project that they were exploited. You know, at this point in time with all these exploits, go exploits going on, and I've wondered about this before, I feel like 99% of projects are eventually going to be exploited in some way, whether that's through a white hat where, you know, the, the bug is found and a white hat is able to kind of like rescue the funds before a black hat does, or there's a critical bug that's been found, it hasn't been exploited and it gets patched by the team. You know, I feel like 99%, if not 100% of projects are going to go through this. In terms of what actually gets exploited and funds that get kind of like stolen and funds that get stolen and that aren't kind of like recovered or are reimbursed by the protocol, you know, it's probably probably going to be a decent percentage as well. So it's always good to think about these sorts of things and think about the risks as well. And this is why I always bring up risk with you guys, because no matter what protocol you're using, even the ones that are extremely battle tested and are like the golden childs of, of Ethereum and of DeFi, such as Uniswap and Maker and Aave and Compound, I mean, all of these things can have bugs in them. All of these things can be exploited in some way, whether that's via uh, direct exploit on the contracts or whether it's an Oracle manipulation or some other kind of economic exploit. These things can happen. So it's always good to play it safe. And that's why I was talking about before with the um, the beacon chain yield for staking your ETH. 
it's near risk free because of the fact that yes, there can be bugs in there, but uh, it's a, uh, the beacon chain is a lot easier to reason about because it's not doing any of the you know I mean it's doing a lot of really fancy uh, stuff under the hood, but it's not doing a lot of the stuff that has a large attack surface like what um what DeFi does because with DeFi you have the economic exploits which are quite quite intricate. I mean, you have the Oracle exploits, which are, which are, which are, which are a big deal. And then you have a bunch of other ones that can be done as well, such as kind of like exploiting the, uh, the, the borrowing rate or the, or the kind of like funding rates and kind of like, uh, uh, uh kind of like flooding the market with, with a certain asset and then withdrawing another one. There's a bunch of fancy stuff you can do here and I'm sure we're going to see more of them, but, uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, just wanted to kind of like point that out. It was an interesting kind of like, um, kind of attack here. I'll read it, Igor's thread for a full breakdown on how that one worked. All right, so Scoopy Triples has a really, really good thread that I want you all to read on STETH and RETH vaults on Alchemix. And basically all the ways that you'll be able to kind of like earn an even greater yield on your ETH or on your staked ETH derivative tokens such as RETH and STETH. Now, obviously there's additional risk here, but I mean, you can see all the use cases that Scoopy has, has talked about. So use case one, turbo staking. Getting 11 to 13% on your ETH is good, but what about 22 to 26%? You can leverage your borrowing for two times leverage, effectively doubling your APY. You can self-liquidate your position to exit with your original deposit plus earned yield at any time. Obviously, extra risk here, guys, but huge. I mean, 22 to 26% yield on ETH, like, Paid in ETH is crazy, like seriously crazy. That's that, that's a, that's a really cool use case there. Uh, use case two: spend and save. You know, love. Do you love your precious ETH stack and can't bring yourself to sell it, but also want to realize some of your newfound wealth? Where well, you can deposit into Alchemix, borrow AL ETH, and cash them out. Watch as your debt gradually melts away because it's a self-repaying loan. It's going to pay that debt back with an ETH stake deal there cash out plan, you know, think basically DCAing out and in and stuff like that. You know, there's other, I mean, this he's got like seven use cases here, which I highly recommend giving a read, but this is what's going to happen, guys. Like we're going to have the vanilla ETH staking yield. Then we're going to have the derivative yield. Then we're going to have the turbocharged derivative yields. And I wouldn't be surprised to see 50 plus percent degen yields on staked ETH, probably even higher than that, um, depending on like mar the market action. And some of these yields, well, a lot of these these higher yields will actually depend on market action. So if the market's hot, the yields will be kind of like higher. If the market's quiet, the yields will be lower. But you're still always going to get that vanilla yield from the protocol itself, which isn't relied on market forces. So that's really, really cool and really bullish. But give this thread a read. Obviously, be in the YouTube description below. I'm running out of time. I've gone over time. I knew I was going to go over time on this episode. There was so much to talk about. But there's one last thing I wanted to talk about, which is probably going to take me about five minutes. So this episode is going to be a long one today. But Awoki shared a meme on Twitter where he's got like a picture of, I guess, I think that's Jesus. I don't want to insult anyone by getting this wrong here. I'm not a religious person, but I'm going to assume that's Jesus talking to a bunch of people and, and they're saying, you know, I give you the tools to end climate change, poverty, and corruption. And the people then ask, when moon, when token? We all know this, right, guys? Like this happens so much in, in the ecosystem when we have all these amazing tools. We can do so much good with these tools, but most of the time people only care about making money from them. And I've talked about this before in, in at length where I've said that making money is fine, especially for people who are new to the ecosystem and their only goal is to make money because maybe they don't have much and they really want to create a lot of wealth. That's totally fine. But I think there is a kind of like a fine line to tread here. And I think that when you think about the greater good of society as a whole, making money is a lot of the time very good for the individual because obviously the, the money is going to help you in your own life and it's going to help you do things to improve your own life. But as a collective, it can be very poisonous. Like... For example, if you make a lot of money and then you give none of it, none of it back, it kind of like results in what we've been seeing with like the ETH core developers saying, you know, a bit not being paid enough, right? Public goods not being funded enough, leading to tragedy of the commons and stuff like that. Uh, and then people not embracing the tools to kind of like, you know, fight these existential issues such as climate change, poverty and corruption. And I think we can do better. We can do a lot better. And I think it's going to take a, 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 a while for us to get to the point where we do better here because... This stuff is definitely secondary to the money-making aspect of crypto. But as I've discussed with you guys before, when I talk to people outside of crypto about what I do, like people ask, you know, what do I do for a living in real life, whether it's family members or extended family members or other people's family members, I describe it to them. I, I first start off by saying, I'm in the cryptocurrency industry because I know everyone knows about cryptocurrency. I'm not going to mention Ethereum because there's a lot of people surprisingly that have never heard of Ethereum. So I just mentioned cryptocurrency. And then I'm like, oh yeah, you've probably heard of Bitcoin as well, blah, blah, blah. 
And then they're like, oh yeah, isn't that all a scam? Or, you know, isn't that all kind of like just uh, a, a kind of like a pump and dump? Like I see all this stuff about people losing money and then they've heard of NFTs and stuff like that. And I and then I spend the next like 10, 15 minutes explaining what I do and explaining how there's this whole other side to crypto, the tech side that you don't hear about in the mainstream media. And they get really interested at that point. A lot of them do end up getting very interested. They're like, holy shit, like I had no idea that this side of kind of like cryptocurrency existed because they still think cryptocurrency is all currency. They still think it's just money. And they're like, oh, the government's going to ban it or it's just not going to work because how can you have a money that goes up and down in value? And then on that note, when they say that, I explain to them, I'm just like, well, your dollars go up and down in value too. You're just comparing dollar to itself. If you compare the dollar to uh, what things you can purchase with it, whether it be, or just fiat currencies in general, if you compare it to things you can purchase with it, uh, your purchasing power goes down over time. And I use the classic example right now of uh, people's utility bills, especially in Australia, they're actually going up quite a bit. I say to them, how much have your bills gone up recently? And they're like, this, this, uh, such and such. I'm like, okay, well, then your dollars haven't been stable against your bills, have they? And it starts ticking. It starts ticking in there. But that's a kind of like, um, you know, a side note there. And that's more on the kind of like money front of things. But then I explain to them, you know, how these tools can actually be used to uh, do better coordination or have better co coordination with humanity. I tend to lose some people when I, when I talk about this because this is like deep crypto stuff. Um, but some of them are, are interested in it. They're like, okay, well, you know, I can see how this could work. You know, a lot of them say, oh, yeah, there's a lot of corruption in the government we need there should be a better way to kind of like organize there should be a better way to do this such that blah blah, blah. and when i start talking about social media as well and i say to them social media has like you know kind of like not destroyed society but like i think on net maybe made society worse off at least kind of like democracies because of the fact that there's so much bad information out there now and it just kind of like hits people and it's, they find that find it very hard to kind of like go, go through the noise to find that signal but I truly do believe crypto plays a part in all of this, and that's what I explain to them. and And they do they do get it. And some of them aren't really interested in it, but you know, a lot of them a lot of them do get it. So yeah, I mean, I just thought this was a great great kind of like meme from Owoki here that kind of like really explained exactly what's what's going on. Like everyone just cares about money a lot of the time in the crypto ecosystem, which I, as I've said, is totally fine, guys. It is not something that's bad necessarily, but I think that. You know, you got to, a lot of people should look beyond money. You can make money, but then think about how you can give back on obviously Gitcoin grants, other public goods funding, like the Protocol Guild and stuff like that. I think that's always a worthwhile cause to think about there. But anyway, on that note, after this very long episode today, I'm going to end it there. So thank everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.